All right. Can you hear me now? All right. Hey, guys, I want to say, first of all, it's good to see you guys. I want to start off with something. Love you guys. Okay. All right. I love you guys. Just wanted to do that, Kevin, for you. Hey, listen, it's good to see you all here. Uh, if you're watching online, man, I just want to welcome you to, to our services today. Uh, let me say, I guess it's appropriate that it's a windy day because I'm a windy preacher, but, uh, but this will be good. I uh, just want to love the Lord. We just want to have a good time in the Lord this morning. Um, I think we would all agree that we are living in a very different period of time in our lives for these last three months or so. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, things are changing so rapidly. You know, this COVID-19 has come around, and, and it's changed the way we do a lot of life. Uh, you know, we do social distancing now, right? So you go in stores. I don't know if you guys are like me, but you go in stores, and they have all these little tape areas down. You're supposed to stand so far apart. You go down some stores, and they've got one-way aisles going down through there. How many of you are like me and go down the wrong aisle all the time, all the time? Do it all the time. But it's very strange, you know, world that we live in. We've got the social distancing, and then on top of that, um, you know, we, we, we go into other things. I mean, one day the school's just let out, you know, and, and, and life changed for the kids, life changed for the teachers. Um, you know, businesses were closed. I mean, one day people were going to work, and the next day they didn't have a job, and they're not sure if or when they're going to go back to work. I mean, it's just a change of life. And then many of those people who are working, some of you are working at home now that you never thought that would happen, but you're working from home. I mean, it's just a different world that we live in. Things, our life is so different for us and so challenging for us. And, it not, and it's not only affected the way we do life, but it's also affected the way we do church. You know, when we first started off, we started off of online streaming services, and, and that was good. That was better than nothing for a while. But then in, on Mother's Day of this year, we, we came out and we started driving church. And I don't know about you guys, but I've really enjoyed driving church. It's been a blessing. And, and as Dee said earlier, man, or, or I think it may have been Eric, how the Lord bless us with some great weather. I mean, just some beautiful weather to do drive in church. And so we've adapted to drive in church, and hopefully everything will work out to where we'll be back in regular church next week with a few modifications. So keep that as a matter of prayer this week as well. But not only has, you know, another thing that's changed is I know when we first got into uh, doing church, a lot of the online teaching started off. Kevin started an online uh, Bible study on Easy Talks. How many of you have been involved in that online Bible study of Easy Talks? He started teaching from the book of James, and the teaching was really great, but I will confess, I only made it through two Wednesday nights online because I just get distracted too easy. And I'm sitting there watching the teaching, and all of a sudden the microphone feedback starts coming up, or the whiteboard pops up on the screen, and nobody knows who put it there, right? And nobody's going to admit it was them. So we just have to wait 10 or 15 minutes till they get it off. And so all of those things happen, and I just got so distracted, I just said, I can't do this. I told Kevin, I said, man, I love you, but I just can't do easy talks. It's not easy for me. And so it was a little change uh, in, in doing that. It, it changed that. But one thing about the teaching, he's teaching from the book of James. And I love the book of James. And so even though I didn't finish the online teaching series, it did get me back into the book of James. I started rereading and going over the book of James because, again, I love it. it. Because James is a book that talks about how real faith works in the life of a Christian. And, and how real faith works in the life of a Christian who is going through challenging times of life. Who are experiencing problems. Who are experiencing trials. And again, I think that describes a lot of us this morning. And so we want to talk about that. So this morning, what I want us to do, I want you to grab your Bible or grab your Bible app or take out your sermon notes because the scripture will be printed on there as well. And we're going to look at the first five verses of James chapter one. 
And what I want to talk to you about today is how to deal with the trials of life or what I would call seven truths regarding the trials of life. And these are truths that we find in the God's, God's Word that I think are so applicable for our lives today because if we're going through trials, we need to know how to overcome the trials and not let the trials overcome us. And that's what God's Word teaches us. So we're going to do that and we're going to see what the Bible says regarding how we approach the trials of life. Uh, but before we dive in, I want you to just join me in prayer real quick. Father, again, we thank you so much, Lord, for this opportunity, this time that you've given us. And Lord, I just pray that as we go into this time, that, Father, you will increase and I will decrease in this time. Father, that your word will be, go forth, that your word will touch hearts and lives and minds. And, Father, that someone here or someone online, Lord, will hear the truth of your word and that, Father, you'll move in their heart. Lord, we thank you so much. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we ask all of these things. Amen. Now, if you know anything about James, the book of James was written by Jesus' little brother. And, and I kind of feel sorry for James in a way. Because how tough would that day have been when his mom walks into his room as a kid and says, James, your dad and I have been talking, and we've got something we need to tell you. Your brother is God. I mean, you're talking about living up to older brother. That would be a hard act to follow. And, and, and then it was James, not only is your brother God, but he's going to save all mankind. And I want you to think about what it must have been like for James to try to live up to that expectation. To live with a brother, Jesus, who never lied, who never stole, who never cheated, who never disobeyed his parents. He was sinless. Try to live with somebody like that for your entire life. Linda knows what that's like. Well, maybe not. But just think of how tough that must have been for James. James was with Jesus before the disciples were with Jesus. James was with Jesus before the critics were with Jesus. James had seen Jesus throughout his whole life. He had saw Jesus encounter trials and deal with trials and deal with challenges. He had saw all of that. However, what's really interesting to me, in John chapter 7 verse 5, it says that his brothers did not believe in Jesus. When Jesus was on this earth... His brothers didn't believe, and that brother, one of those brothers, was James. But after Jesus was crucified, after he was placed in the tomb, and after he resurrected, everything changed in James' life. James became what Paul described later as a pillar of the church in Jerusalem. A great pastor, a great teacher, a great communicator of the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we dive into this book, we need to understand at the time, James is now that leader. He's now that pastor in Jerusalem. And he's in a setting where Christian, being a Christian is not a popular thing to be. He's in a setting where, as a matter of fact, a lot of Christians are being persecuted because of their faith in Jesus. They're being beaten. They're being put in, in jail. They're even losing their life for the cause of Christ. And it's in that environment that James is writing to these people because they're going through some real difficult times. And he's writing to them about how to deal with difficult times, how to be encouraged in their faith in Jesus in spite of the difficulties they face. And I think the overarching message of James is this. He's saying, hey, Christians, hey, Christ followers, keep on going, keep on growing. And keep on acting like God's people. And I just believe as James wrote to these early believers in AD 45 or you know, to AD 48. I believe that the message that he wrote to them is just as applicable if not more so to us today. Because I believe God is saying to us as we go through our own challenging times of life. Hey Christians keep growing. Keep going. And keep acting like God's people in spite of the difficulties. And so as we open James 1.1, he starts off this way. James, a servant of God 
and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad. Greetings. I think it's interesting here how James introduces himself. You notice what he didn't say? Hey, guys, this is James, Jesus' little brother. No, he said, hey, this is James, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. That word servant's a very interesting word. It's a, it's a word doulos, which means a bond servant. A bond servant, when you think about it, a bond servant's this. A bond servant is, is someone who, who was, used to be a slave, who someone came along and paid a price for their freedom, and yet they chose to go back and serve that person voluntarily, even though they didn't have to. So James introduces himself, and he says, Hey, guys, I'm a bondservant of Jesus. And the reason I'm a bondservant of Jesus is because Jesus paid the price for my sin. He, he set me free. And so I voluntarily go back to him and want to serve him with my entire life. And that's the way he kicks this book off. Then he moves into verse 2. Consider it great joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. So he talks to these believers and he says to them, guys, I want you to be prepared for what's coming down the road of life because you're going to experience difficult days. You're going to, have, you're going to experience some painful, some dark periods of time ahead in your life as followers of Jesus Christ. Now, I know that there are pastors on TV all across this country this morning who will not preach that truth. I know that there's a lot of pastors on TV that will try to convince you that you can avoid difficult days. All you've got to do is think certain thoughts, live a certain way, or give enough money, and things are going to work out good for you in life. But friend, let me tell you, that's not what the Bible teaches. In fact, there is a Greek word for that type of teaching, that type of doctrine, and you may want to write this down. Baloney. That's the Greek word. Because it's not true. That's just not what the Word of God teaches. Instead, the Word of God, and James right here is teaching us, guys, there will be difficult days that come into your life. There will be difficult times that are on the way. And so if that's the case, and I believe it is, then we need to know how that we can biblically deal with those trials and those trying days so that we, again, will be able to move beyond them and not have them overcome us. In this passage, James shares several truths about trials that we need to understand that will help us do this. And so, and so it, as we look at these truths, and there are seven on your outline. I know you get nervous. Preacher hadn't preached in a while. He's got seven points in his sermon, right? So we're going to be here for a while. But listen, a lot of them are going to be very quick, very brief. And then some of them we'll spend a little more time on. But I believe they're important. So follow along, write them down. The first truth we learn about trials is this. And we've touched on it already. But trials are coming. They are coming. Notice he didn't say if trials come into your life, but he said when trials come into your life. Whenever you experience trials, he says in verse 2. Now, some of you are probably like me, and you wish he'd put an if there. But he didn't. He put a when. Sometimes a, a, we face a trial in life. We say, you know, we go, God, I wish you'd have warned me this was coming. I wish you'd give me some advance notice so I could prepare for this trial that I'm, that I'm in the middle of right now. I wish you could have somehow give me a little advance notice. Guess what, guys? He did. It's right here in the Word of God. He says, when trials come into your life. You know what else he said? He said, when those trials come, consider them great joy. What? Is that right? Consider it great joy? Now, why in the world would he say that? Well, keep on reading. He says in verse 3, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. So he jumps out, first of all, and he says, number one, trials are coming. But number two, he says this, trials are test. Trials are test in your life. So if you're taking notes or you write in your Bible, 
In that particular verse right there, verse 3, I want you to circle or underline these words. If you've got, you know, if you do it in your Bible or do it on your sermon page or whatever. The first word I want you to circle in that verse 3 is the word testing. That word means proved or pushed to the limit. The second word is faith. It's a word which means to believe in the divine things of God. The third word is produces, which means to accomplish or to achieve something. And the fourth word is endurance, which means to persevere or to sustain. So when you look at that verse and you put all those thoughts together, what it's saying is this, that when, you trust, when your trust in Jesus is pushed to the limit, that your faith in God is tested, that God is using that trial actually to strengthen you and to build up your endurance as a Christ follower. Now, let me give you an illustration of this. Early on in this quarantine period, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? I don't know about you, but I found myself eating everything in the house. With nowhere to go or nothing to do, eating seemed like a good idea. But then I got to thinking, you know what? I'm going to either have to do something or build a bigger door on my house. That's just the way it's going to be. So I remember one day I got up and I decided I was going to go to do some exercise. I know you guys think I do it all the time, right? But, but I, I, I honestly, I took a break from exercise for one or two years. But I decided I was going to do some exercise. So I got into the room in my study and I did some push-ups. It hurt. Did some set-ups. It hurt. But since I couldn't go to the gym, I have this great piece of clothes equipment in my back room called a Bowflex elliptical machine. You guys saw the commercials? It's not as easy as the commercials. You get on that thing, that bad boy, and you start off and you go fast for a minute or so, and, and then you slow down and you go for another two minutes, and then you go fast for, for a couple minutes. It's a 15-minute program. About eight minutes into that, I'm thinking I'm going to die. I said, Jesus, just come and take me on home. But here's the thing. Once I got through that day, how many of you know the next morning I felt worse than I did that day before? I mean, I, I was so sore, I could not lift my hands up over my head. And it, it's a good thing I don't have hair because I don't think I'd be able to comb it. I mean, it was just a rough time. But, but here's the thing, I was looking at that and I was thinking about that. When you do something after doing nothing for a long time, it's hard. I know a lot of you have done that, right? It's miserable. Because you try to do thing, you try to do something like everything's normal, and then you realize later it's not normal. And the reason it hurts so much is because your muscles are fatigued. They're not conditioned to do what you just did or tried to do, even if it was only for six or seven minutes. Listen, God uses trials like that in our life. He uses trials to condition us. Trusting in God in the midst of trials strengthens us. James says, truth number three, trials grow us. Verse four, and let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Right here, James is telling believers to be prepared because the tests are going to come. And believe it or not, God is going to use these tests to make you better, to make you mature, to make you complete. Now, where do trials come from? Well, some trials, the Bible teaches, comes from God. Some trials comes from the enemy. You guys know you have an enemy, right? But here's the thing you need to understand what the Bible teaches. All trials come through God. There's not a thing that happens to you that God said, Oop, I didn't see that coming. All trials come through God, and that's important for you to remember. As a child of the king, you may sometimes be in a period of time where you feel like God's abandoning you. Uh, especially if you're walking through a difficult period of time right now. But what you need to understand, if you're walking in step with Jesus, if you're walking in a relationship with Him, 
Every single trial that you experience, every single trial that you encounter was approved by God. And he knows what you're walking through. Your circumstances aren't, again, taken in by surprise. Because nothing can get to you without first going through God. He's your father. He's approved the trial you're walking through, which tells me this. Even if it's a difficult trial, then God must believe that through his power, through his strength, through his provision, that I can make it through. Even if it's difficult, God must believe that with him I can make it through. That I can make it through no matter what it is that he has me walking through. So some trials are from God, and he sends them to strengthen us. Some trials are from the enemy, and he sends them to weaken us. God's trials are for our maturity, while Satan's trials are for our misery. But understand, God allows and God uses both kinds of trials in our lives to grow us up and to mature us and to make us more like Jesus. Because his ultimate goal is not that we be happy and satisfied, but his ultimate goal that we become more and more like Jesus. Now, if you truly believe that God is a good father and he loves you, and I know if I took a survey, you would say, yes, that's me, I believe that. If he's a father who loves you and has your best interest in mind, then here's the thing, you've got to be willing to trust him in the middle of your trial. You've got to be willing to hang on in the middle of your trial because he's a father who has approved that difficult season in your life, but he's wanting to make you more and more like Jesus. And listen, God is not only... Is not, is, not, is not only the one who's watching to see how you're going to respond in trial, but do you know there's people in this world that are watching you as well? People that you work with if you're still working, that when you're going through a difficult time of life, they're watching you to see how you respond to that trial, to see if that faith you so talk about when things are good is really real or not. You learn a lot about a person's faith a lot more about the person's faith, I should say, when they're going through a difficult time of life than you do when they're going through a time it's not so difficult. Because number four, trials reveal the truth. It reveals the truth about your heart. You know, if you've ever had a sponge and you take that sponge, a dry sponge, and you dip it down into a bucket full of water and you pour that sponge out and you squeeze that sponge, What's inside of that sponge will come out. It's just like that in life. You know, when you go through life, when you're going through a trial and life is squeezing you and the pressures of life are squeezing you, what's inside of you will come out. Your faith will come out. So we understand that truth. Remember, James is writing to persecuted Christians here, and he's saying, guys, you're going to face in inescapable, unavoidable, inevitable trials. They're going to happen, so be prepared for the test. Now, you read that, and you say, okay, then, how do we know if I'm passing the test or not? Well, let me ask you this question. How do you respond when you face trials? I'm not just talking about having a flat tire, but how do you respond when you're facing some real trials? tests and trials in your life what comes out of you when the pressure's on james says in verse 2 consider it great joy my brothers and sisters whenever you experience various trials paul said a very similar thing over in romans 5 3 he said but we also rejoice in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance hebrews 12 1 and 2 talks about how jesus is our example it says, let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross. Now, I read that, and I don't know about you, but that just seems backwards. I mean, joy and the cross just doesn't seem like it would go together. It seems impossible. For some reason, to rejoice in our afflictions just doesn't seem like the right way to handle it. I mean, everything inside of me, I don't know about you, but everything inside of me when I'm facing a trial, 
is to try to find a way to escape the trial. But Jesus tells us to consider great joy when we experience these trials. Again, keep in mind, these believers he was writing to, they were scattered all over the nation. People were persecuting them. People were after him. And as he wrote, he encouraged them, hey, guys, embrace your trials. Don't ignore it. Don't try to sidestep it. Embrace it. Not because you love your trial. I don't love trials. I, I'm going to just tell you guys, I'll be honest, I don't love trials. But what I do love is how God can accomplish in my life through trials that would have never happened otherwise. Another thing he tells us as true believers is that trials are not going to be consistent. Instead, he says, in, in, and this is truth number five, trials are various. Trials are various. Notice the second part of verse two. Consider it great joy whenever you experience various trials. Now, what's he saying here? He's letting us know that all the trials in our lives aren't going to be predictable. They aren't going to be consistent. They're going to be various. We may, you may be facing financial trials. You may be facing emotional trials. You may be facing spiritual trials. You may be facing relational trials. You may be having marital trials. You may be having vocational trials. You may be having parental trials in your life right now. They're all different. But what we can be sure of is what James warns us here. He says, trials are coming. They're going to test you. They're going to be unpredictable. They're going to be various. So you better be prepared for the road ahead. Why? Truth number six. Trials are places of decision in our life. Now, why do I say that? Because when you step into a trial, into a difficult situation, into a difficult problem, into a challenging time of life, you're also stepping into a place of decision. And you're going to have to make a decision if you're going to allow that trial to draw you toward Jesus or, you, or that trial is going to take you away from Jesus. I have saw so many people over the years who they, go, they come into the church and they get so happy and they're so on fire and then a trial comes into their life and you don't see them again. It takes them away. So we need, it is a places of decision. You see, trials make you really come to a decision point. You're going to decide whether Jesus is good enough, that Jesus is capable enough, that Jesus is trustworthy enough, that, that he can get you through that trial or not. Or are you going to, you know, what some people say is, yes, I believe Jesus is able, but when a trial comes, you know what happens? They give in to worry. You know what worry is? Worry is really you just don't trust God. That's what worry is. We say, God, I trust you, but then a problem comes and we worry about it. We can't sleep at night. We can't go on. And we've all been there. But all that it shows me when I'm in those times is that I'm not trusting God like I should. I'm not trusting his provision. Trials are decision points in our life. And you're going to decide whether that trial is going to take you closer to Jesus or that trial is going to take you farther away. Maybe you're wondering, okay, now I get this, but how can I have joy when disappointment comes? How can there be joy when a bad doctor's report is delivered? How can there be joy when, when I'm laid off? How can I be happy without being, when I'm sad, without being fake? Well, let me tell you what this isn't saying. It's not telling us that you need to plaster a fake smile on your face and go around and say, Oh, praise the Lord, I got cancer. Praise the Lord, I, I, I don't have a job. It's not saying that. It's not saying to be fake. Let me show you something interesting in this. It says in verse 2, consider it great joy. That word considerably mean, literally means to evaluate something. When James says consider it great joy, he's using a tense in the Greek language, an aerial tense that speaks of joy that follows a particular event. So it's like this. You get a terrible doctor's report or something completely unexpected happens, something that doesn't naturally produce joy in your life. This is saying that when the trial passes, when the victory is won, 
after you've sensed the power of God in your life, in that moment, in that crisis, in that problem, after you've seen what God is able to do in that season you're walking through, whether it turns out the way you want it to or not, once you trust God that much, you have joy. That's what it's saying. James is saying you may find yourself in darkness, but the sun's going to shine tomorrow. He's not talking about a joy that comes after the dust is settled, but he's talking about, or before the, before the trial, but he's saying, hey, during the trial and afterwards, you're going to have joy. I like what a guy named Walter Kaiser said. He said, we are not to rejoice in, in the pain, but in the future reward beyond the pain. Verses 3 and 4 again, let's read it. It says, the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. You know when it says you'll be mature and complete, lacking nothing? You know what that means? You'll be more like God. You'll be more like Jesus. You'll become more godly in your life. And he's saying God uses the trials of life to get you there. He uses trials in your life to transform your heart and change your heart. And because those, tri those trials, he can get you a place with the Lord that you could never get without him. You see, here's the problem with this whole thing. Are you ready for this? I think all of us would say that I want to be more like Jesus. I, I mean, if I took a poll right now, you, now, you may raise your hand anyway because you don't want to be honest because you've got all these Christians around you. But I would, if I were to take a poll right now and I would say, hey, how many of you would love to be more like Jesus? I would guarantee you that almost every hand here would go up. But here's the problem. If you want to be more like Jesus, you're going to go through trials. None of us want to experience trials. That's the hard part. I mean, we want the joy of the cross, but we don't want the cross. That's like me saying, I want to get in great shape, and I want to get abs, not a keg, but I want to get abs without exercising or without eating right. You know, that's not going to happen. There are things I have to do. James is saying, guys, it's cause and effect. You reap, then you sow. Endurance through trials produces maturity. When we, fail, when we fail to persevere, when we quit, when times get tough, then we mess out on the opportunity to mature. We mess out on the opportunity to become more like Jesus. Paul put it this way. Perseverance produces character. James says basically the same thing in a different way. He says endurance produces maturity. What you see is an obstacle. God sees it as an opportunity. It's an opportunity to grow you and to make you more like Jesus. You say, okay, well, how do I get there? I mean, how do I get to a place where I consider it great joy? Whenever I experience various trials. Well, look at verse 5. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. Do you see what just happened there? God says, hey, when you're in the middle of a storm of life, when you're in the middle of a trial, you need to take a time out and you need to ask me for wisdom. You need to ask me for wisdom. I love that. If any lacks wisdom. Hey, how many of you lack wisdom? I'm honest. I could put both hands up if I wasn't holding this microphone. I'm honest. I lack wisdom. And... and and God says, hey, if you lack wisdom, good news for you. Come and ask me for it, and I'll give it to you. And how will God give it to us? It says generously, generously. God's like, hey, guys, I'll give you wisdom. That's not a big deal for me. Just come and ask. James says he gives it generously and ungrudgingly. I mean, that means that when I come to God in the middle of a trial, in the middle of a problem, in the middle of frustration, I go, God, help me here. God's not like, man, can't you do anything on your own? I mean, I, I'm God. I'm running this whole universe, and, and you want me to take time out to help you with that problem? Can't you do anything on your own? God's not like that. Instead, when I go to God and say, God, help me, God's like, I'm glad you asked. That's what I want to do. 
I want to help you because I'm a good father. And a good father wants to do good for his children. And I want to help you mature. And I'm glad that you're humble enough to admit you need my help. You know, that's what I love about altar calls at the end of services. You know what an altar call basically is at the end of the service. It's not just that the praise team comes up and sings a song, but it's a place of decision that every one of us get to. But when we go forward or we go down or, or right where you are, you can sit there and make a decision for Christ. What you're acknowledging, God, I need you. I can't do it on my own. I've tried, and it's just not working out. And when you humble yourself to the point and you say, God, I need you, guess what? The good news is, God's there for you. He's there for you to help you with that situation. You know, I don't know what kind of problems you're facing today. I really don't. But I would guarantee in a, in a group this size that there's different problems. A lot of different problems going on. And I, and I don't know what you're facing, but I want you to understand God knows. He knows, exact, he knows how you've been responding to it. He knows whether you've been relying on yourself or you've been relying on Him. He knows, how, he knows, knows whether or not worry has got, got your mind or whether the, God's got your mind. He knows that. But, but the thing is, God says, hey, I'm here for you. If you need wisdom, I'll give it to you. Just ask me for it. You say, but preacher, I've got a problem today. Well, guess what? God's got wisdom today. You say, but Tony, you don't understand. I've got a lot of problems today. Guess what? God's got a lot of wisdom today. You can write this down. It's not in your sermon notes, but, it, but I think it's something you need to remember. Your problems will never be bigger than God. They'll never be bigger than God. Your circumstances that you're going through, it will never be so scary that God can't deal with them. You'll never find yourself walking through something that God says, hey, I'm sorry, I can't help you with that. He can, but you've got to be willing to ask. You've got to be willing to humble yourself and say, God, I need you. I've tried it on my own. It's not working. I need you. Now, those of you taking notes are probably excited right now because you know I'm getting to point number seven. But point number seven is this. If you're a Christ follower, this is, this is exciting. And that's this. Trials are coming to an end. I mean, you've got to get that today, guys. In this life, we got problems. But they're coming to an end. You know, Kevin's been talking about resurrection. He's been talking about one day, you know, that body that hurt me when I exercised for eight or ten minutes. One of these days, I'll have that glorified body. These things are coming to the end. One of these things, we won't have things like COVID-19 or sickness or death or any of these things. They're coming to an end. And for a Christ follower, that's exciting. It's exciting to know that. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7 says it this way. It says, you rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which though perishable is refined by fire, may result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's saying, guys, yeah, life's hard sometimes. It really is. But you know what? In comparison to eternity, it's so short. It's so insignificant. There's coming a better day. And that's good news if you know Jesus. But let me tell you, if you don't know Jesus today, if he's not your Lord and he's not your Savior, your trials will not end at the grave. There's this whole eternity without God where your trials will be magnified. And, I, and God wants to let you, God's saying to you today, look, seek my wisdom. Humble yourself. Understand, if you could do life on your own, then you wouldn't have the, all these problems. But you can't. You need me. So today, if you're not a Christian, I think God would be saying, today could be your day. 
Today could be a new beginning in your life. Today could be a day that you know a good father who is there to help you and there to support you and will help you through the trials of life that you're going through. And so I encourage you to do that if you've never accepted Jesus. But if you are a Christian, hey, grow in Jesus. Lean on Him. Seek His wisdom. Live for Him. Keep going. Keep growing. And keep acting like God's children. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this opportunity you've given us today. An opportunity to gather and open your word and open your truths. And Lord, you just bless us so much. But Lord, I know that in a crowd like this, that there are people who are experiencing various problems, various trials in their life. And, and Lord, honestly, some people today, even though they say they love you, Lord, they've been trying to resolve their problems on their own. They've been looking for their own solution. They've been letting worry take over their heart. Today, Lord, my prayer is that you just allow them to experience the humility where they can say, Lord, I need you. And Lord, that they'll seek you. And Lord, you'll give them the wisdom for the next step of life that you want them to take. And Father, if there is someone here today who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, my prayer is today that they will understand that you're there for them. You're a good Father who wants to give them your love. And Lord, I pray that that will happen today. Lord, we thank you so much. We just love you. It's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen.